Good morning. I, I wish I could explain how excited I am for where we're going this summer, like as a church, the stuff that, that I'm learning. And I feel like that I'm just getting this whole new, huge concept on where we're called to go, what we're called to be, just the culture of what God's doing here. And, and in learning all this and going through all this, then we sing, have you ever wondered what the words, my fears are drowned in perfect love? Like, I know we say it, and I know that we know that that is the words, and so therefore we sing, my fears are drowned in perfect love. But if you understand the concept of what is actually being said there, of how fear is related to love and how love is related to God and our understanding of who God is, I'm telling you, if we, by August, by August, I don't think we're going to be able to go through a worship service the same as we are right now. Like wherever you're at in your walk with God today, great. But by August, my, my thought is that we're gonna have just an entirely new, and when I say revelation, I mean God giving us an insight to who he is. It changes all of it. I'm sitting here in worship going, it all makes more sense to me. Um, and it's not even my week to preach. So one of the things that, that I've been challenged with is that we as a church, if we're not careful, we have started to really lean heavily into the political realm to be the source of what God actually called the church to be. Like in my opinion, the, the food supply in a community, if it's not there, we look to our government and we go, you're not doing a good enough job. What we should be doing is looking inward going, God, what could we do to be a solution to our community? What could we do that would provide more of who you are to our community? And I think we get so, we get so confused as to what the political realm is responsible for that we lose what are we responsible for. The church has been tasked with stepping up and taking a certain stance in the social realm of our communities. And so that also means this. What does happen politically matters because it's what's creating the, a, a, a space so that when we feel God call us to something, we can go freely into that. It's not the underground church. We're not in fear of persecution if we step outside what the government says we're allowed to do. And so when God calls someone outside of the church and places them into the political field, that's huge for us. I love that God said we're not withdrawing from the world. Remember, he said we're not pulling out of the world. We're going out into the world. And so this morning, I'm excited for you guys to get to hear. I was here in the first service. It's awesome. But Mike McLean, here's what, he, here's what he means to the community. He is our state rep in this area. He's the House Minority Leader for the Republican Party in the state of Oregon. But here, specifically what he is, is he is Mary and Jacob's dad. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha. We're excited to have him up here. You guys are going to enjoy this. We're excited to have him and hear his perspective. And he preaches out of paper. Well, good morning. And uh, if you're new or this is your first time, I am, uh, I'm not a pastor. And, uh, <clears throat> but I like pastors. <laughs> but uh, I love the scriptures. I'm not a theologian. But I love the scriptures. I study them, love history. And uh, I was going to share some thoughts today on my journey to study how God views work. Because that's something we all do. We all do something during the day. Some of us are compensated for it. Some of us volunteer. But how does God view work? And now, I have three jobs that are, I get paid some amount to do, and so, um, uh, but I'm not in a full-time ministry. I, I have never been, and so, uh, for an example, I, I, I have a job, like most of the people here have jobs and aren't in uh, ministries or church staffs uh, by, by way of being full-time or compensated, and so, um, I have a job, I'm a member of a law firm, I'm a lawyer, live here in Powell Butte with my wife Holly over there, and uh, we, uh, we raised our three kids here in Powell Butte. But I, I have a law firm in Bend, and um, fortunately, uh, people will actually pay me to do some of that work, and so um, that's one of the ways. The other ways is I'm a, um, I'm a reservist, a military officer in, in the uh, reserve, uh, the Oregon Air National Guard. And, uh, but I'm also, uh, as Jordan said, an elected official. I was uh, elected eight years ago to serve in the House of Representatives. So you don't have to worry, this isn't going to be a political speech, although I'm, I'm, I'm willing to give one. <laughs> I have some thoughts on how things are going. 
but uh, uh, but I served uh, in the House of Representatives, uh, and um, you know I get paid a small amount to do that, and uh, so you know we get to do these things we do every day, and I have thought a lot about since I was young what it means to work because I wanted you know, my life to matter. And um, I've come to realize that, you know, our work, what we do every day, the way we serve our customers, the way we accomplish our tasks, it's frankly more important than we might think. So my hope is today you're going to be encouraged that what you do not only matters to God, it matters to your community and to your world. It's how God reveals himself to a world that has tremendous needs, physical, emotional, mental. So the first time, remember, the first time that anybody in the Bible was recorded to have been filled with the Spirit was a worker was a craftsman to do work. And the interesting thing is that phrase, filled with the Spirit, often, I know I have, associated that with sort of, well, you have to be really spiritual. You have to be sort of learned in the scriptures or somehow reached an openness with God to enter into his providential plan. Those are all wonderful phrases. But the fact is, when you study what it means to be filled with the Spirit, I, I, I was surprised the first time ever is for a guy to create stuff, to build stuff, to design stuff. It wasn't a priest, and it certainly wasn't to do like missionary work. It was ordinary work. Now, I studied when I was in college this I, phrase, filled with the Spirit, because some friends and I, we lived in a fraternity in, at Oregon State University, and Alpha Gamma Rho was the name of the fraternity, or AGR House, the AGRs. And most of us were from small towns or had been farming. Um, the, we almost all were majors in agriculture. I majored in agriculture resource economics. And we were in a Bible study, we were studying this, you know, what it meant to be filled with the Spirit. And at that point, we wanted to, you know, have our lives matter. And so all the people that we saw around that were, we thought, filled with the Spirit, really doing things, were all full-time guys, you know, pastors and college ministry guys. And, you know, they were very influential on us. But none of us were studying to do that. We were studying to just, you know, to go get jobs. And it, it, it really struck us that somehow... We were working so hard to make the starting lineup on the JV team. But, you know, the guys on varsity were like these pastors and church guys and ministry. And it, it, this, it bothered us because we thought, well, why are we putting in all this time, you know, to be JV? And we read there's this great scripture from Ephesians chapter 5, 18, 21. It says, and do not be drunk with wine. In which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in the heart to the Lord. Now, so, you know, our impression was, well, when you're filled with the Spirit, you're like a worship leader. Or we got to write songs, you know, pluck a harp, I don't know. Um, but, uh, you know, the first part of the verse obviously was meaningful to a bunch of fraternity guys is do not be drunk. And so that was the first thing. Actually, when I turned 21, I got a note from the guy in the Bible study, do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the spirit, which, which was helpful, actually. <laughs> That's a different story. But this thought of being filled with the spirit, you know, to some young guys, 20 years old, trying to follow Jesus at college, uh, we were under the impression that, you know, that maybe being filled with the Spirit meant that, you know, we should do something others, uh, you know, for a profession than other than we loved. 
Luke 1.15 says, in referring to John the Baptist, for he will be great before the Lord, and he must not drink wine. Oh, there it is again, isn't it? He must not drink wine. Now, I, I, this is not about wine. I, I, we were in a fraternity in 20, and it came up a lot. More beer than wine. But the point is, he must not be drunk with wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Spirit, even from his mother's womb. So that was what Jesus, you know, this guy, John, Jesus said was like one of the greatest prophets who ever lived, one of the greatest men who ever lived. And so, you know, to a 20-year-old, I read that and thought, well, I guess being filled with the Spirit means you're a prophet. And then in Acts 2, chapter 3 through 4, we have the day of Pentecost with the apostles. Now, the day of Pentecost is a Hebrew tradition and a feast that follows Passover. And these followers of Jesus had assembled in this room and Jesus had ascended and they were waiting for uh, the coming of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, who, of course, we now know 2,000 years later, changes everything. He just changes everything. And so they were waiting in this room and suddenly the Holy Spirit comes. This is a significant event. And divided tongues of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. So, again, this phrase filled with the Spirit. We studied that at 20. And we thought, well, maybe being filled with the Spirit means exercising these gifts of God. And I want to share a thought today that Yes, being filled with the Spirit means all of that, but it means something more, so much more. Because I've come to realize that the study of the Scripture means taking the whole of Scripture together, looking at the themes of each book in the Scripture, the 66 books, and seeing these phrases in the culture, in the text, in the context in which it was sitting. As, as I looked at the Scripture with more mature eyes, and of course, now I need these, is I realize that being filled with the Spirit is something that happens to all of us and can happen more and more as we just every day go about our lives. Again, look at the slide one, if we could get that up there. And being filled with the Spirit first happened in the Bible in Exodus. In Exodus in slide one was... Um, a, uh, a powerful f verse. I'd love for... There we go. And... But I... Look at what, what says here. God is speaking to Moses. And God says, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uriah the son of Hur from the, uh, of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the spirit of God in wisdom, in understanding, in knowledge, in all manners of workmanship to design artistic works, to work in gold and silver and bronze and cutting jewels for setting and carving wood and to work in all manner of workmanship. Now, God was discussing with Moses at that time what would go into the tabernacle, the, uh, the place where in the time prior to the Messiah, who we believe was fulfilled completely in this person, Jesus of Nazareth. The Messiah had not yet come, and they were trying to understand what it meant to be God's people, and the symbolism that was contained in the tabernacle was amazingly important, reinforcing that God is redeeming and restoring his people, and that the God's love pursues you and God said hey we're going to design some things and we need to have things created in such a way that people look at it and just go that is beautiful I mean have you ever seen a painting you ever have you ever seen a chair I have a friend who made a chair you just that is beautiful and 
So God filled a craftsman, a workman with this spirit to inspire him, to focus him for his creativity. Moses later in slide two, we see Moses telling the people what God had told them. And this is how Moses described that experience. Moses said, see, the Lord has chosen Bezalel, son of Uri, son of Hur, from the tribe of Judah. And he has filled him with the spirit of God, with wisdom and understanding, with knowledge and with all kinds of skills. To make artistic designs for work in gold, silver and bronze. To cut and set stones, to work in wood and to engage in all kinds of artistic crafts. And he has given both him and Oholiab, son of Ahai Samak of the tribe of Dan, the ability to teach others. And he has filled them with skill to all, do all kinds of work, engravers, design, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The ability to teach. Did you ever think that some people are filled with the Spirit and given the ability to teach, that ability to reach somebody? Have you ever had a teacher make an impact in your life? Open something that you didn't see before. Have you ever had a teacher, a boss? Maybe you're drilling a well or you're putting up hay or somebody to show you how to do something. Wet your appetite for discovery. Did you ever have somebody show you how to fish, show you how to hunt, show you how to sow. God, in one of the first instances of recorded in the Bible, is equipping, showing us how to be a teacher, how to be skilled, how to show others, how to engrave and design, embroider. You know, when God created the world, he put Adam and Eve in a garden and said, cultivate it. Here's a garden, cultivate it. He didn't say, you know, develop a master plan for evangelism. And we're going to seek the world. No, he, he just said, grow stuff, cultivate. As if somehow growing something out of the soil, learning to get up every day and do something, do work, had the ability to connect us with our creator God. In the garden. We had a job. Proverbs 16, 3 says, commit your work to the Lord and, when you're, and then your plans will succeed. 16, 11 from Proverbs, the Lord demands fairness in every business deal. He sets the standard. Every business deal, the Lord demands fairness. That means the Lord is observing. That means when you're transacting a bag of groceries, now, I know we don't think of it often as a transaction. We don't come up with our cart at Safeway and say, you know what? 50 bucks. <laughs> Someone else says 75 and you meet in the middle, right? We do that for cars and other things. But groceries, it's got a price, right? But in the end, it's still a business transaction. If you're a cashier at Safeway, God is into your work. If you're selling cars, God is into your work. If you're selling services for heating and cooling installation, God is into your work. He observes every business transaction. Ecclesiastes 3.13 says, And also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all his labor. It is a gift of God. Your labor, enjoy it. It's a gift of God. We may, we may say, I don't understand your gift. I don't like your gift. I would prefer to give it back. <laughs> but the reality is there is something in it for us and God fills us with the spirit to do what we do every day. An opportunity to be the image of God in a workplace that sometimes encounters people and you may be the only Jesus they ever see or hear. In how you sweep the floor or dial for a sale on the phone is somehow showing them that there is a God who loves them, a God who loves this world. And, you know, frankly, it's just meeting needs, physical needs. It, 
It's a, how you provide for your family. Psalm 90, 17 says, May the favor of the Lord our God rest upon us. Establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hand. God establishes the work of our hands. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul, an amazing man, he wrote these letters to different churches that were located. And, of course, they had many different cultures. Many of these early followers of Jesus, some of them were slaves, some lived in Rome, some were rich, many were merchants. And they lived in different places. But he consistently said the same thing about work to many different churches. In Corinth, 1 Corinthians 10, 31, he said, So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Eat, drink, blow your nose in a tissue. Do all for the glory of God. I don't, you know, you get up every day. You go in. You work at Napa and you sell auto parts. Do that to the glory of God. There's something in it, in what we do every day in work, that is anointed, that God wants to do it. And God loves it. God loves it. In Ephesians chapter 6, he says, We do the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as the Lord and not to man. Whatever you do in Colossians, it says, chapter 3, verse 23, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving Christ. If you're a cashier at Safeway, that person in front of you with those bags of gr- or that cart of grocery, that's, Paul is saying, hey, treat that person as if they were Jesus because somehow God delights in it. So much that he delights that throughout the scripture, he's into people who work. Now, the question becomes, why, do, why did I at age 20 think that there was a varsity team and a JV team in work? You know, when it comes to spiritual stuff, I thought, well, you know, if you work meeting spiritual needs, you're varsity. If you work meeting physical needs or emotional, mental, you know, you're JV. I I was young, I was mistaken, but you know, part of it is our culture. Part of it is we compare. I mean, you don't have to watch TV or stream a movie or do much, and you realize that we're always kind of comparing. We're, well, this, you know, this job pays this, and therefore, oh, that's a better job because it pays more, or this or that, or that's a... It's our culture is telling us there are two teams, the better and us. And that's not the biblical way to think. You know, in Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, it says, we're renewed, transformed, transformed by the renewing of our mind, that how we think about things affects our ability to be transformed into the likeness of Christ. Do you know my favorite, well, one of my favorite verses is this old Proverbs says, as a man thinketh, so is he. That literally, our life begins to take shape as we think. That's what the scripture says. And so what I realized, I'm starting to sort of categorize God. And it was as if I also said, you know, God must prefer certain things. You know, this idea that, hey, God loves all of us, but he does like some of us better than others. Well, no, that's a human thing. That's not God. And the idea is, you know, if I'm a lawyer that takes a case and, you know, establishes constitutional law, well, I may be a better lawyer than someone who's just helping a local business navigate a tough situation. The idea, you know, the idea, over and over and over, I'd made the mistake of saying, well, God prefers certain jobs. But that's not what God says. He highly values work, and he highly values work that serves people, that meets basic needs and brings value to communities. In a way, it's sort of not the work that's higher, it's the needs. Yes, I know people have spiritual needs and physical needs. And by physical, I mean, you know, biological, meaning physical, emotional, mental. We have needs. We're in communities. We're human beings. Our work 
that meets those needs honors God. Whether those needs are spiritual, physical, emotional, mental. To God, work has intrinsic value. Rick Warren, you may have heard of him, famous pastor in Southern California, wrote a wonderful book called The Purpose Driven Life. But in it, he says something powerful. He said, work becomes worship when you dedicate it to God and perform it with an awareness of his presence. Work becomes worship when you dedicate it to God and perform it with an awareness of his presence. They had this problem, you know, in the early church. It was, uh, it was uh, chaotic in a lot of ways. I mean, they had so many people who were so excited about Jesus and the day of Pentecost came, and then the Holy Spirit enters into the picture. And you realize, we see even from Ezekiel, not Ezekiel, but, uh, you know, Bezalel, and, you know, being filled with the Spirit. Man, that Holy Spirit, he changes things. When he comes on the scene, it is a new story. It is a new story. And to be filled with the Spirit, these, I mean, these people were doing amazing things. And people were being filled with the Spirit, and people were going, I'm in. And, you know, next thing you know, they had thousands of followers of Jesus, and they were sharing their food and meeting. And, and one of the problems is people weren't getting fed on time. Now, one thing I've learned about communities that love Jesus and get together and share meals is that it seldom goes smooth. I love meals. Meals is great. God, God's into meals, and it's so fun. But, you know, some people don't get food on time or some of that. They had all this problem, and it started really causing issues amongst the people. In Acts chapter 6, they, they said, look, we got to solve the problem. And so they said, let's, let's find some people who can just administer, who can organize, who have that gift of being able to pull off something. I think we all know people like that in our, our lives. They're, you know, chief operating officers, so to be. They're fantastic, you know. So here is what the resume is, according to the apostles. They said, therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, who you will appoint for the duty. So who knew that being a great administrator an organizer, being able to pull off events or whatever, your resume item is be full of the Spirit. You know, normally when we think of full of the Spirit, we'd say, well, that's going to be the preacher. But right off the bat, why do we see right out of the Scriptures is, no, that's the person who basically figures out how to get the meal put on, get people fed, get people moved on, and then the place in the kitchen cleaned up. You got to be full of the Spirit. Let's go, if we can, to slide three, if it's possible. Jesus said this. Look, when you think about how, what prefers, what people prefer and what people don't prefer, let me put it this way. When, let me restate that. When, when people think, what does God prefer? Sort of like this work. Yeah, but isn't there some work that's more important than the others? That's his disciples asked that question, in essence. I don't know if you know, in John chapter 6, and if we have slide three, we'll get it up there. But it says, John chapter 6, verse 28. And then they said to Jesus, what must we do to be doing the works of God? And Jesus answered to them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him who he has sent. So every time we get tempted to think, yeah, but what do I have to do to sort of rise up in stature in God's eyes? Jesus addressed it and says, you want to know what the work God requires of you? Believe in the one he sent. Well, who did he send? Jesus. Believe. He went on and, and said this in slide four, John 14. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And greater works than these he will do because I'm going to the Father. Greater works, Jesus said. I'm gonna, you're going to do greater works. Because the Holy Spirit's coming. And when he arrives on the scene, he changes everything. And I'm going to the Father. And you're going to do greater works when you believe in me. What are these greater works? 
I mean, I got to, you know, if we're filled with the Spirit and doing a greater works, I assume we're like, you know, it's quite a show. But I examine just, I mean, just look at the miracle of feeding 4,000 to 5,000. About a year ago or so, I shared some thoughts called the math of Jesus, how Jesus does math different than what we think. But if you look at the miracles where Jesus fed 4,000 and 5,000, he did it because people were hungry. And perhaps, in part, his motivation was just to feed people. Matthew 25, 31, it says, or excuse me, Matthew uh, 15, then Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now three days and have nothing to eat, and I am unwilling to send them away hungry lest they faint on the way. Then he goes on and does a miracle. So we know that feeding people matters to Jesus, just making sure that they have the ability to hunger. As one guy said, you can't preach a sermon to someone who hasn't eaten all day. So Jesus had this uh, phrase in Matthew 25. It, it was a story about a king who would bring all these people together and he'd put the sheep on the right and the goats on the left and he would talk and he was given this sermon and he, and he said, you people, on, you on the right, go into your eternal reward in your inheritance because I was hungry and you fed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. Many may recognize it. And then later on, they said, well, how? How, how, how did we do that? And then they, when did we ever feed you when you were hungry? And then the king says to them, when you've done it to the least of these, you've done it unto me. Could we agree that God is into feeding hungry people and that Jesus is recorded to have done at least two miracles. Made wine, maybe a third, we'll throw a third in there. But the point is, he fed people, and these were miracles. Lots of people. Well, I want to tell you a story about a greater work. Who might be some of these people who do these greater works when they're filled with the Spirit? What would be a greater work? Well, I would say feeding a billion people is a greater work. I heard this story from Andy Andrews, a DVD I was watching, and he deserves the credit for exposing it, but there was this guy, Norman Borlaug, who went to Iowa State. He was a AGR, I'm proud of this guy, he's from my fraternity, AGR. Um, the other famous guy from AGR is uh, Orville Redenbacher. I mean, <laughs> we don't have that many famous guys, but I do have my picture with Orville, and I'm proud of that. Um, so Norman Borlaug was given the Nobel Peace Prize in 1970. He was given the Peace Prize because he had figured out how to grow wheat in an arid climate. He had developed through hybridization plants that could grow wheat, shorter stalks, survive in arid climates. And it led to famine going away in India, and Pakistan, eventually Africa. He is credited, by all accounts, with having saved over one billion lives and counting. Now they say it could be up to two billion. A billion people have not died because of Norman Borlaug from Iowa. Now, Jesus fed 4,000 and 5,000, and they're credited with being miracles. And then he said, you know, if you believe in me, if you believe what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit, the teachings that I have. If you believe in me, you're going to do even greater things than me. Is not a billion people fed and kept alive greater than 4,000 and 5,000? Let me tell you the rest of that story to maybe connect a few dots. In 1865, there was a farm in Missouri, and it was raided by Confederate raiders, and they came and burned the barns, killed some people. They carried off and eventually killed this woman, Mary Washington, African-American woman. She had two small children, an infant boy, a couple months old, daughter. Susan Carver and Moses Carver owned the Missouri farm, and Susan had promised Mary that if anything ever happened to her, she would look after her kids. And so she and Moses tried desperately to find what happened to these 
to black children. And they located that these raiders had still had the boy with them. And so they offered to buy him back and all this stuff. And eventually he met him with his one remaining horse. That was it. That's what they had after the raid and the hardship of war. And so Moses Carver walked and handed the horse over to the raiders, his last horse. And they got back. The alleged had the, they had the boy in a canvas or a gunny sack or whatever and just tossed him. And, you know, Moses caught him, put him inside his shirt, walked the 10 miles back to the farm trying to keep him warm. Moses and Susan Carver raised that boy, George, like their own, taught him to read and write, encouraged him. That African-American boy, George Washington Carver, became one of the greatest scientists in the world. He was educated at Iowa State University and then went on and developed rotations of crops that saved the South from devastation. The South had this cotton plantation or, you know, the rotation of the crops where it depleted the nitrogen of the soil. And George Washington Carver, a black man, became a professor at Tuskegee. And he developed this idea that if you rotated from cotton to peanuts, you would replenish the soil for nitrogen in the modern crop rotation system developed and it saved the up and down and it developed and pretty soon these farmers finally had money and they could improve their farming techniques and it is credited with changing agriculture in, in the United States and then the they had all these peanuts and so in 1916 George Washington Carver published this article 105 ways to use peanuts for human consumption. 105 ways, who knew? Many of the same products we use today, peanut butter. He's given credit for founding peanut butter. When he was at Iowa State though, maybe he did his most significant work. He was studying to be a PhD program and they wouldn't let him live in the dorm at that, the rules were at that time because he was an African American, couldn't have student housing. And so an alumni of, of Iowa State had him live with his family, had him look after his son. They b became very close. Uh, Henry Wallace was his name, senior, and Hen Henry Jr. And so George Carver Washington would go on walks with Henry Jr. when he was babysitting him and taught him to love plants and put an idea in him that you could change the world by growing a plant, changing agriculture. And Henry, young Henry, never forgot it and became very close to George Washington Carver. Young Henry Wallace grew up and became Secretary of Agriculture, then in 1941 became Vice President of the United States. And he told President Roosevelt, I have this idea, I've had it for years, we, and I've been pushing and pushing and pushing, but now that I'm Vice President, fund this program for me. I wanna go to Mexico in this arid climate. We're gonna grow wheat, and we're gonna learn how to grow it in an arid climate. We're gonna feed the world. And Vice President Henry Wallace hired Norman Borlaug, who developed that plant, who saved a billion lives. So I gotta ask you this, who really saved a billion lives? Was it Moses and Susan Carver who saved a little black boy in 1865? Was it George Washington Carver who inspired a little child, a little child in Iowa? Was it Henry Wallace who developed this program and then gave this job to Norman Borlaug and the vision and the resources. The point is, every one of them had a hand in it. You can never separate it. Never separate it from the hand of God and who did a greater work, who did a miracle. Let me conclude by saying this. God places us in history. You were born at a certain time and that was not random. You were born in a year that a providential God chose. And you are placed in history. And the simple work that we're doing of serving people are like dots on a page. And then someday, we're able to connect those dots and an image emerges of a loving God redeeming and restoring humanity. I know 
that we can be discouraged sometimes that what we do is not cool. But let me tell you, you are varsity. Because there's only one team. And what we do each day is important. Filled with God's love, our working every day is glorifying God and changing the world. Trust in the truth that the scripture teaches. That his hand is on your life. What we do is used by him for amazing miracles. Let's close in in prayer. Father, we thank you today for your Holy Spirit's work in our lives. And we know that this world can too often discourage us from the joy that comes from you. Your joy is our strength. I pray that you would encourage us in our work. Let us be filled with the Holy Spirit to work and to live in a way that you love to see. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.